until we are attuned to our emotions and feelings. Always easier and um, better if both both partners are working in this together. It's connecting me with my emotions. It's bringing my heart online because tuning, tuning into it so that we have better access to it. Miki, welcome to The Vibrant Couple. I understand that you're an Enneagram specialist. Please tell us more about what you do. Thanks. Uh, yeah, pleasure to be here, Valdo. Thank you. Um, Enneagram, it's often seen as a, a personality typing model, a system for personality typing, but it does go much deeper than that. In relationships, in life, in work, career, health, well-being, the thing that will cause us problems again and again and again is the fixations of our personality. And the Enneagram is a model, a system which teaches us how that's happening, how our personality is taking us out of presence and causing familiar type of suffering in our life again and again. So some of us might be extremely anxious and overthinking, and some of us might be extremely needy or dependent on others. Or some of us might be extremely dominating and controlling or something, right? So there's, there's var various different types of personality and each one is, it can be a little bit too much or it can be a, a little bit of not enough of something. And either way, it's causing a problem in our lives. Please tell us about the three types of intelligences that we have. I remember yeah. being fascinated about that when we first talked. Yeah, so fundamental to the Enneagram, that's absolutely fundamental to it, is the fact that we have three intelligence centers, one being the head, one being the heart, and one being the gut, or the body, sometimes people call it. And they have different types of intelligence. And... Again, if we're overusing or underusing or misusing, if you like, any of these intelligence centers, and we all are, uh, that's, that's how the Enneagram types appear, uh, or the, the personality types appear, is that we are misusing, for want of a better word, uh, these, uh, these intelligence centers. And for example, I'll give you, we'll talk, we'll go into more detail later, but just as a, a bit of an outline to start with, the head center is our it's where we think, it's our thoughts, it's how we make meaning, it's our perception, uh, it's vision, you know, thinking about the future, having vision for the future, it's having uh, clarity. And then we have the heart centre, which is feelings and heart, uh, love, compassion, connection, acceptance. And then we have the gut centre, which is like your, it's your action centre gets things done, gets you moving, it's your life force, your power. And interestingly also, your sense of self, your identity is of the body of the gut center as well. And these three intelligence centers, we want them to be working together, right? We want them to be working together in harmony, pointing in the same direction. So my thoughts, my feelings, my actions are aligned, I'm congruent, I'm integrous, and my life is easier when it's like that. And they want to be operating in the healthiest form. So not like overthinking here and overly sensitive here and not much life force or so kind of apathetic and feeling um, almost lazy, like I can't get going. And that's just a bit of an example of when they're misused. When we first talked, I remember being intrigued by you saying that we basically teach people to treat us one certain way or that people treat us the way we teach them. So please say more. Yeah, uh, this is something that's, it's been an important lesson in my life. And people that I've worked with, you know, you can kind of see quite quickly how the people around us are teaching us to treat them. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an example. So if you imagine if somebody, as they approach you, they're very timid and the shoulders are kind of pulled in and they talk a little bit quiet like a mouse and don't want to take up too much space and they say sorry all the time. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, and like they're on eggshells. They're teaching you to treat them differently to somebody who takes up a lot of room and they're big and proud and they hold themselves strong with direct eye contact and they speak confidently towards you and not kind of shying away. But they're... these two people could be in exactly the same body and look identical but you would treat them extremely differently. 
based on those. And the intelligence centers and the, the Enneagram types and other differences, shall we say, other unique uh, idiosyncrasies and traits that we might have that are more personal to the individual very much control how we show up in that way. And so we're always telling us and telling people how to treat us. That makes sense. And so in a couple, which is who the people I primarily work with, um, one of the challenges is often a partner comes to me and say, hey, I wish my partner showed up differently. For example, with the example of the little mouse, I wish my partner acted more confidently. And so how do you use the Enneagram to work with a couple so that the person that um, wants to be supportive of their partner to be more confident can do that? Okay. I'll start by saying that firstly, it's always easier and um, better if both both partners are working in this together, always. But I also recognize that's not always possible. Mm -hmm. and, so, and often, unfortunately, it's not possible. And it's one person trying to do the work and the other person um, is, is not interested, right? They've got their own things that they're dealing with and their own interests. If I'm dealing with both people, I would share the Enneagram with them and all about the personality types in enough depth that they can see each other's um, struggles. So with the Enneagram, with this particular model, for those that don't know, it tells you the the thing that you're like the emotional ache, the thing that's that hurts you inside, the thing that you're trying to escape, the thing that is painful and it's causing you to behave a certain way. So, for example, if somebody really, really needs to belong, then they might become more of a people please kind of energy because they need to belong, they need people to like them, and it's really controlling how they are. Um, somebody else might have something completely different, um, like my own. is It's known as gluttony, something that I'm dealing with. It's like a need for stimulation. It's It's this insatiable hunger inside that's always there needing contentment, satisfaction, satiety, some kind of relief from this insatiable hunger that's always there. Now we all have these, and in a relationship when when a couple that know each other's, then it's easier to not judge and criticize your partner for doing theirs when you realize how difficult it is to not do yours. Does that make sense? It opens up more compassion, more understanding. It evens the playing field. So one person might be pointing the finger and saying, you should be more like this. And it's like, the fact that you're doing that is your fixation and I'm doing my fixation. So you doing that to me is actually you doing the same thing I'm doing, just your equivalent of it. That for me is really, really leveling in a relationship. So what I'm understanding is that you are invited couples to play together. You're invited to get to know themselves. You're inviting them to judge their partner less. And as a result, there is more space for both of them to grow. Yes. Um, an example would be in my own relationship, my partner, and um, what she's dealing with is called a sloth. It's known as sloth which actually, um, and indolence, it's like this, this very, very difficult for this type to do what they really need to do for themselves. It's some people call it laziness, but it's not lazy. Like I don't want to work. It's lazy in terms of doing what I really need to do for my highest good for myself and my well being. now. Is that Enneagram type nine? That's Enneagram type nine. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, my own, which is type seven. So mine is gluttony. And then this ego fixation, as they call it, and what my head is doing is this like planning, constantly looking at the next thing, the grass is greener over there, the future. And it's constantly reframing and rationalizing and trying to make everything different, better to what it is. And thinking of the, you know, um, rose tinted glasses, thinking of the future and planning the next thing. The, the gut types, the type nine is a gut type. They're about the body. They're about the present moment now. I'm a head type, right? We're all about the future, resources for the future. In our relationship, it's been quite clear, something that's caused issues in the past has been that I'm 
wanting, I'm planning something for the future and I'm getting all excited, excited about it. Cause that's what I do. And I'm brainstorming and I'm planning and my partner's saying, can I just, I need to do this thing now. Uh, can I just, and I'm like, don't interrupt. Hang on, hang on. I, I'll lose my train of thought. I've got five different things going on here and I need to get them out and I need to join these dots and make sense of what I'm doing. And she's sat there, but I, now I need to do this thing. I need to do it now. So I'm in the future. She's in the present. Um, so our fixations keep us uh, in different areas. Uh, the other thing would be that I constantly seek stimulation and excitement and something, you know, my, my life might want to go a little bit more like this. This is something that I've eased off over, over the years, uh, consciously using the Enneagram. Uh, but we know that type nines don't want this. They want to stay in the middle. They want their life to not have that intensity. They don't want to be too intense up or too intense down. Don't rock the boat. Peace, peaceful, calm comfortable, that's how they want it. And I went, I want to have fun, right? I want to be excited, I want to... And so we've got these two very different energies. Now, knowing this about each other, we can meet each other somewhere in the middle. It's not about one person's wrong, one person's right, or both people are wrong. It's like somewhere in the middle, I let Emma's calmness, her, her peacefulness, I let that rub off. And then she yes. lets my enthusiasm rub off on her. And between us, we kind of meet somewhere in the middle and compliment one another. Yeah, I can see how the two of you, if you're not aware of it, you could clash big time. And if you are aware of it and appreciative, then she can calm you. And then you can invite her to be more excited about what is it that would be good to do for herself. Yes. It's funny, we just did that very thing last night. Um, she was tired and it was time for bed and I personally was um, brainstorming something trying to solve a problem and and I was like saying I really want you to get in here with me and be excited with me and and solve this problem but kind of sometimes it feels like you're, you're disengaged right and this is the, the issue but knowing her type I know how to communicate this a little bit nice more nicely and the moment she said okay then then I was able to not, you know, uh, to resolve that little potential conflict that might have happened and to communicate with her in a way that she didn't feel attacked. That's very important for a type nine. If she feels attacked, she shuts down, she withdraws, she goes numb, she can't hear the same. This is, this is what this psychological structure does. Uh, but instead it was for me to communicate calmly, peacefully, not be too excited right? Because there's too much of a clash of energy. Invite her into my space a little bit, see how that goes. And she says, okay, yeah, do you know, I would like to be like that more often, but I just feel like there's a problem. So we both resolved the problem together. We had fun doing it. We were um, in a, that nice brainstorming bubble of energy. That's a problem I'm seeing many couples having, and some of them might be that seven, nine dynamic, and some may be for other reasons. And so I heard you last few minutes talk about understanding each other, supporting each other, and also you toning down your head center and her somehow toning down her gut center. At the beginning of our conversation, you were talking about the alignment between all three. So do you also do something in addition to your main center, which is your head, to do something to communicate with her through her gut or through your gut and vice versa with her to find ways to go through her head? But let's talk about you first. What do you do so that instead of diminishing your head, you bring your gut in addition? Yeah, and my heart as well. Um, it's kind of important to note that each type will ha they'll have like a priority. So one of one will be prioritized, and there'll be another one that's the opposite. That's kind of repressed, suppressed, um, less trusted, less used, less engaged, and both of these are kind of causing issues, right? Because they're out of balance. And for me as a seven, uh, the one that is the most repressed is my heart. 
uh, which was a real surprise to me when I learned about it. And then having gone deep into this, these teachings, ah, of course it is. Now I can see, I can see why, I can see how, I can see how that's affecting the way I am. I was metabolizing my relationships with my gut and synthesizing them and thinking about them and wanting to eat my relationships. So it wasn't like this open hearted embracing. It was like, oh, I love you so much. Come here. Mm, you know, like with a baby, I could just eat you, right? And it's like gustatory language like that. I could just eat you. Mm, juicy relationships. This gustatory language is it's because my gut is hijacking what my heart is supposed to be doing. And it's so um, it's like it's trying to metabolize and eat and devour relationships, people, and this is how it works. So my main job has been to balance all three, but definitely to bring my heart online. Please share more about that because I totally see how what you're describing is the seven nine dynamic. I'm also seeing that this is very typical in man woman sex, where he basically creates the intimacy through having sex and she wants the intimacy first before having sex so please tell us more how what you do to open your heart okay and there's there's kind of paths of least resistance self-inquiry is my is my chosen technique tool method um practice whatever word you would i tend not to like the the words like technique but more of a practice, but it is kind of a technique. Um, we explore the three intelligence centers very, very consciously. And so what that would look like in the heart center is I feel my emotions, I feel my feelings very deliberately. The way I do that is I have a space holder, I have a group where we do this for each other. I'm also part of the diamond approach, um, quite new to the diamond approach. This is very, very aligned with the way that I that I work. So I decided to to become a part of that. And so this is about feeling our emotions, feeling what we call affects, affects being kind of a more all encompassing word for feelings and emotions. And also uh, a deeper sense, you know, like the deeper joy and compassion and things like that, that uh, it's not really an emotion. It's deeper than that. It's more fundamental. It's like emotions rise from that space, um, but they are not that they're, they're a little bit deeper essences they're like essences um so i would and this is this is how i work with it if they have a problem in my life something that's I'm a sticking point which we always do right there's always something there that's the, the next thing that's been shown come and look over here come and deal with this so i would bring that to mind and i will tune into what emotions is that bringing up i forget everything else this is how i tune to the heart and I'll spend lots and lots of time with um, somebody sat across from me just like you are now, normally online. Sometimes it's Emma, sometimes it's somebody in the group. And they will literally just hold space and keep their presence on me like you have now, which is amazing for helping us stay present ourselves. Just somebody just really watching in stillness and every now and again repeating some words back. And then what I do is I tune into my emotions and I just name the emotion as best I can. So it might look something like this. So I might be sat here and I might say, sadness. And as I say sadness, and I feel sadness, I sit in that sadness, completely in it. As much as I can, give it free reign over my entire being. And I just allow myself to be in it. And then it'll change at some point. And I just name the next emotion when it changes. So it might change to relief, which is quite common. And I'll just say relief. And I'll sit in that nice relief. And then I might say, oh, trepidation. And then I'll sit with that feeling and wear that like an outfit, immerse myself in it until it changes. And I do this for like between 30 minutes and an hour, nonstop, regularly. In doing that, not only does it really give us access to our emotions, but because we're in a state of observation, we're disidentifying from the emotion at the same time, which is so crucial in to being non-reactive, um, non-emotionally reactive. You know, the uh, is it Viktor Frankl who said, uh, between stimulus and response, there is a gap. 
and in that gap is the choice to choose our response something like that um it, it really helps widen that gap i mean how important is that for relationships having a gap between what the person's done or said or what's going on it what the kids have done what's happened in the house and your response to that it's connecting me with my emotions it's bringing my heart online because the 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 heart's function is feelings and emotions so i'm attuning to it and i'm and i'm doing so in a way that makes it healthier and because that disidentification right if i think i am my emotions and my emotions are like this then i'm like that super reactive mm -hmm. like i'm on a little boat on the waves of the ocean and i have no choice where i'm going i'm going where the waves tell me to go right mm -hmm. yeah. but if, if i'm <laughs> deeper than that because i've observed and i've allowed my sense of self mm -hmm. to become deeper than where the emotions live i'm sat on the bottom of the ocean nice and relaxed where it's still while the waves crash around above me so this is the the metaphor that we that we use to teach and it's really really useful and it's quite accurate i would say thank you for sharing about your practice and so while you were sharing i followed your invitation and i basically relaxed and opened my heart and i could very much feel what you were talking about the like the essence i could feel a very great sense of compassion and love that was wonderful yeah i mean as as we kind of excavate as we inquire yeah. and move into whatever's there we will often have these waves of beautiful feelings it can take a while for us to get there to work through i think the important thing to know is until we are attuned to our emotions and feelings and not everybody is until we're attuned we cannot really easily or or um or frequently experience those beautiful emotions like the compassion and the more unconditional love and that deep sea of, of peace you know the deep-seated peace because we're not attuned to that field if you like we're not attuned to the effective field and so we need to attune to that field to invite all of the all of that in the positive and the negative and the ups and the downs so yeah super important i just want to say even though we might be um that's like the obvious one for me the heart because i wasn't connected to it we never just work on one all the time like i will give this a lot of my attention but i give equal attention to my head and to my gut as well because the idea is balance the idea is all three of them given equal amounts of attention or at least a lot of attention each and having them in the same space at the same time gives them the opportunity to speak to one another you know consciously putting them in the room together they resolve their own conflicts and um, so anybody who knows about ifs or parts therapy or these other modalities will know that this this can be quite a common way of, of healing in a conflict is just have the parts in the room at the same time and sit back and let them talk to each other in the head that would look like observing the voices observing the characters that are in there because it will all have this critical parent like the superego that's kind of waving its finger and saying don't do that put that down you didn't do very well there you can do better and it also cheer you on that's it very good good you know good on you you did good there so this is a character that we have in our head and there's other characters that feel more victim feel like they're being attacked and all these and i've heard some funny actually really interesting characters people have found in there doing this work with us and um, but yeah, observing again, this identification and you start to see, wow, those characters, what they're doing has been the story of my life. Just showing how suggestible I am to those characters and how much I'm governed by them. And then in the gut or in the body, what that looks like is sensations. So if you've got a tension, you feel a bit of a tension, I get a bit of a stiff neck and I've got a stiff shoulder here. And when I go into it, it starts to reveal things. It starts to allow my body to move it tells my body where it wants to go and sometimes like I mean, you might have a lump in your tummy and it'll work its way up and you just track it follow it comes up through the chest up through the throat and sometimes it comes out of the mouth and not and it's almost like something's actually coming out i see this quite often I and mean, it's just because we're bringing awareness to attention and some tension and as we do it kind of it starts to relax and it releases something that comes up and out 
and I've known it go down the legs as well or coming up and behind the ears and out of the top of the head. Uh, so that can be super interesting. So you acknowledge the shady characters that <laughs> somehow populate our <laughs> every thoughts. Yes. And you also acknowledge and release the tensions you have in your body and allows you to be more present. And so what is the work for the heart? So that's the feeling, feeling the emotions, feeling the, the, the uh, feelings and emotions, the affects in the body, it's sensations and, and kind of impulse when you feel like you want to do something and in the head it's the characters so that's all three of them and then as you as you work with them individually so that's basically like tuning tuning into it so that we have better access to it and then we bring it all together and then you use all three so if i'm working through an issue or i'm thinking i would like to experience some joy and then I can, whatever it is that I, I'm choosing to work with or work through, I can go inward, eyes closed, and start to let it unfold in all three intelligence centers and just see what's going on, right? Just see what the character's doing, what feelings are arising, where are the tensions in my body? And you can get some pretty spectacular kind of releases and experiences just doing that. And you don't, you don't need somebody. It's easier with somebody watching you like this so much easier I, i highly recommend having somebody watch you one person how much of that do you do with your partner and how much do you do with others that you have no basically strong relationship with just then they are practice partners in a group yeah so um i do it with my partner less now because we had a baby nine months ago so things are a little bit different And he's nine months old now, yesterday. And so we have less time where it can just be me and and Emma. Uh, but we still do, when he's in bed, we'll still do this for, for each other. Um, in my, the course, the, the community, the course that I run, we have a group of people, uh, the Enneagram one and then the self-inquiry one, there's two. But they kind of work together so that we have same same participants on both. And so we all help each other and we... We do it together during course time, but then uh, the participants are often agreeing to meet each other outside of that as well. And then they can have their own private sessions between them. Uh, super important, like say, in having somebody there at first, just until you, um, just until you get used to doing it. I think now I find that I can do it on my own, not quite to the, the level, to the quality as having somebody with me. But as long as I'm speaking out loud, And I'm saying what I'm experiencing a little bit, that keeps me focused. So if anyone's listening and they want to try this and they don't have anybody to help them to hold that space, just as long as you're speaking out loud, that should help you kind of stay focused. And just try 10 minutes, try 15 minutes at a time. And over time, it's something that we can develop. Uh, so I'd probably spend about three hours a week in front of somebody, maybe. Uh, yeah, about three hours a week in front of somebody doing this. Um, it will be more soon as well because we've got things developing, communities developing and becoming part of the diamond approach. And so there's, yeah, there'll be more time soon. So just kind of bringing this back to relationships. In doing that, we become an easier person to be in relationship with and we become less reactive to the other We've been more responsive rather than reactive and we feel better in ourselves. And the one thing that I loved, uh, love about Enneagram, but you, you don't need Enneagram for this to make sense, is that the relationships that survive uh, or that are successful, let's say, because survive and success isn't necessarily the same thing, right? Success can be we learned all the lessons and we both left and we'd had everything we needed from that relationship and we were ready to move on. And that's a successful relationship as well, right? It's not all about survival. Um, but the ones that, that are the healthiest are the ones between healthy individuals, the ones between people who have who are well psychologically and perhaps are um, they have a sense of whatever that is, like uh, who they are and how they operate and what's important to them. I think when you get these people together in a relationship, there's less need for problems. Um, and it becomes what we might call an interdependent relationship, right? Versus codependent. Um, 
I like to think of that. So codependent, you lean on somebody and they move, you fall over. <laughs> uh, but this interdependence, I see it more as like two, um, two people stood next to one another and they kind of lean on each other like that. But if one moves, the other one just stands back up. And they, they, they stand perfectly on their own. It's not, we're not relying on each other, but we are um, working together at life. I like the tango metaphor when it's two people somewhat leaning on each other, but moving and dancing with each other Excellent. as we both learn <laughs> and Excellent. grow and open. I've not heard that metaphor. That's perfect. I like it. Yeah. I've, I've only done the tango once. I went with Emma um, and yeah, that they said, you're only just touching your partner. Right. And then you, you the, the, The goal is that you just lightly touch each other enough to give it a signal, but you're not grabbing, you're not moving. You're both learning how to move through gentle touch. Yeah, right. Perfect. I'm a total beginner. And what I'm loving is that there is very much of a sense of leadership and followership. So it's not because one says, you know, move right or move left or move your foot back. It's both listening to each other and adjusting and somehow creating the next step together. Of course, it's the masculine that leads and the feminine that follows, but it is that co-creation that I find beautiful and, and I'm definitely exploring these days. Within the movement, it's still both, isn't it? Like she can still move mm -hmm. her hands back and, and he moves his hands towards. So there's still kind of both happening, both are leading and following within that. That, that was my experience of it. So I'm in agreement with you and I want to be careful about the politically correct bullshit about both are leading and both following. And so yes. there is only real leading if there is following and there is only real following if there is leading. Yes. If this video inspired you to liberate more love, either in your current relationship or in a relationship you're longing for, please hit the like button below and subscribe so you can be notified when I publish new juicy content. I look forward to seeing you very soon.